Anything with an engine has always fascinated me. From the time I was old enough to hold a screwdriver, I was taking things apart. At 15, I got my first car, and my love for automobiles hasn't stopped since. I guess you could say I've had an affair with every car I've owned, and there have been many. I always have something on the go in the shop, and I want to share what I've learned with you. We're hitting the road to talk to people who collect, restore, preserve anything on wheels. So let's go! Hi, I'm Dirk Burris for Classic Drive Television. Today, we're at the foremost microcar museum with Charles Gould. We're going to look at his cars, see some of the things he's doing, and ask him why he's doing this. Charles, welcome to Classic Drive. Thank you very much. So you've got just a wonderful collection of cars here. Can you tell us a little bit about it? What got you in this hobby? Well, we just really, uh, we used to collect more uh, conventional cars like Jaguars and Corvettes and things that were a little more valuable. And uh, we were collecting for years and we loved the cars, but it got to a point where they became investment pieces and we were going to meets and people weren't using their cars. They were either trailering them or restoring them and they didn't really know anything about the mechanics. And frankly, the hobby got a little stuffy for us. So we bought one little Isetta and it was pretty tattered and kind of falling apart. We brought it to meets and people left Bugattis to come and see it. And they were worried about you breathing on the paint and we were riding kids around the field having a blast and that yeah. just changed everything. Well, you know, that's what it's about, guys and gals about enjoying this, bringing your family into it and bringing other people into it. And it doesn't have to be a great looking classic or even running in some cases. So Charles, um, how about your kids? Were, were, were they excited to be part of this? Were you dragging them, kicking and screaming into this? Or, or were they something they wanted to do? Well, I had two daughters that literally grew up with it. We literally had a playpen in the garage. And I remember one day I looked up when I was working on a car and one of my daughters, Tiana, was uh, next to a car with carving a screwdriver into the paint on the door. And I just thought, that's great, you know, she's trying to do what I'm doing. So rather than getting upset with her, we just nurtured that. And my kids are very involved now. They not only work on them, but they drive all the cars, they ride motorcycles, they kind of commandeer some of their own that I can't get to drive anymore if they like it enough. So yes, they're very involved, as is my wife. Well, that's terrific. And to have a wife that's actually involved in this and wants to be a part of it, that's something special. Um, uh, did, did she uh, start this with you when you started with the Jags? Uh, she started long before we were married. We actually got our first car together and she was involved from the first moment. And everybody says I'm very lucky and certainly I am, but it's more than just luck. The trick is that when they're cold or tired or bored, you have to go home. You can't make them stay through that discomfort because then they learn to hate the hobby. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is if they, if they grind the gears or they, they damage something, you can't cringe and scold them. You've got to remember that we ground the gears too when we learned how to drive. If you let them make mistakes, they learn to love it as well. Well, that's terrific, and that's sort of the attitude you took with your kids as well. Absolutely, right? yeah. And now they, I mean, my, daughter, my daughters grew up, they learned to drive on a right-hand drive mini moke, and they could drive that before they could drive anything else. So they, they knew standard transmissions, they knew right-hand drive, and now, you know, they're, they're just the envy of all their friends at school because they have stuff and drive stuff that nobody else even understands. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. So um, you've got just this incredible selection of cars here, things I've never heard of. Um, uh, anything stand out here in particular for you, something that's special, something that uh, really, really says it all for you? Well, there's a lot of cars that, I mean, it's very hard to pick a favorite. It's like picking your favorite child. It's just really hard to do. But there's some that are very unique. Messerschmitts are probably by far my favorite. I just love the way they handle and drive. And with the two-stroke engine, they're really pretty quick for a microcar. And the Tiger particularly is probably the holy grail of the, of the collection. Um, but I like all kinds of things. I love the Mercer, I love the Nash, the 49 Nash, the Multipla. I'm crazy about Fiats. It's really hard for me to focus in on everything. I get a kind of attention disorder and I get distracted to something different every day. 
So really cars from all over the world, both yes. Asia, Europe, Germany, um, uh, even uh, a few from the U.S. here, and uh, some more modern ones as well, really. Yeah, we got very interested in the Kai, Clara, car, Kai class of cars from Japan, and then later there was a bunch of retro cars made in Japan in the late 80s and 90s that were made to resemble vintage cars from the 50s and 60s by Nissan and also by Mazda, and we love those. We've really taken a liking to those, so we have some of those. But when I first had that first Isetta, you know, I was discovering it like people are discovering it when they see this collection. And I was finding things I had no idea was out there, and it just became more and more obscure and kind of like a hunt for, for the Holy Grail. And now, you know, now I think we've got a good assortment, but it took a long, there was a long learning curve to figure out what was out there. And we were doing this long before anybody cared about these, so we got a lot of them very inexpensively. We had some given to us. We dragged some home that we probably shouldn't have. But years later now, they're coveted, and we love them, so yep. it's, it's quite a collection now. So you really got quite a large family here, don't you? Yes, we do. <laughs> but the thing about this collection, and it's different from a lot of collectors, is um, I like original cars. I'm really very fond of original cars, so they're not flawlessly restored. And for me, for me, cars are the only uh, antique that we completely erase the history to make them perfect. You know, you'd never do it to a piece of furniture or to a painting. And for me, every nick and dent and scratch tells another chapter in its half century of survival. So I like to preserve that, unless they're too far gone. And the other thing that's very important about this collection is we very much love to share it. And we have a crew of about 12 volunteers that work on them. And we work on Saturdays and on Sundays we all go for a nice country ride and have lunch and they get to drive all the cars. And the other thing we do is that um, I think we're losing the next generation of car collector because I think it's really, um, kids aren't interested anymore. And it's really no fun to, to walk around a hot asphalt parking lot and being scolded not to touch anything. So we're bringing kids in and having them wrench on them, we're letting them drive them, we're letting them make mistakes and, and grind gears, but they, we're instilling a passion and we're trying to do that with the next generation because, you know, we're just custodians. Somebody's got to take care of this when we're gone. Well, that's true. We really are just custodians. We really are just here for a short period of time and I think the mission needs to be leave them better than they were when we found them. Yep, right? I agree. Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. Hey, this has been a terrific visit with Charles Gould at the Microcar Museum. Um, uh, this is Classic Drive Television. We'll be back to see some of these cars in the future. I'm Dirk Burrows. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Dirk Burrows for Classic Drive Television. In the 1930s, the running board era reached the pinnacle with this 1933 Marmon with a V16 engine. This car has a particularly interesting history. It was actually burned or set afire by an angry wife whose husband had spent the money on this car instead of a new kitchen for her. Join us for cars like this and others on ClassicDriveTV.com or join us on our Facebook page. Hi, I'm Dirk Burrows and we're back at the Microcar Museum and we're going to get the real story now about these cars from Tiana Gould the daughter of Charles Gould, who we interviewed before. And she's going to tell us a little bit about how she got forced into this hobby, but uh, now is a lover as well. Well, welcome. Thanks for having a, a talk with us. So um, you were telling me before uh, the interview that uh, you actually got your license in one of these cars. Maybe tell us about that car. Uh, I actually learned how to drive on a 1970 Mini Milk. Um, I learned to drive it when I was nine, and it's a right-hand drive transmission. Uh, so you're actually sitting on the opposite side of the car. So it was a little confusing at first, but it was fun. So you had to sort of figure out the difference between shifting and turn signals and <laughs> arm signals and things like that? Yeah. yeah. So is that, the, is that the first small car that you drove? Yes, it is. Was. So what have you driven and what kinds of things have you done since that, that day? Uh, other cars? Yeah, I've driven a lot. I really like the Triumph TR3 and the Mazda AZ1 that we have. Those are really fun ones to drive. Um, and I've been learning on everything. So you've really sort of expanded out, and, and I imagine you must have driven the Isetta or a Metzeschmitt, things like that, yeah? Yeah, I've driven the Isetta. That one's more difficult. It's very touchy with the clutch and the gas, but it's, it's a fun one. Well, that's terrific. So have you ever uh, got to take these to school or, or you know, impress friends? Uh, yeah, I took a bunch to school when I was in high school, and I actually just took the Mazda AZ-1 to my job uh, last week, and everyone loved it. Everyone was asking me about it. So this is what it's like to be a celebrity, huh? 
<laughs> I guess so. So have you ever worked on the cars? Have you ever um, uh, taken things apart, broken down? Uh, yeah, so I grew up helping my dad in the shop, and that's actually why I chose to go to school to be a mechanical engineer. Oh, very good. So yeah. so not only did this hobby bring out uh, the fun, but it also brought out a love beyond this. You're, so mechanical engineering was your, your hobby of choice or your, your, your career of choice uh, because of the cars. Yeah, exactly. I love it. So. Well, that, that is absolutely terrific. You know, you know, I think that's one of the important things to take away from this, that sometimes our hobbies... Um, for our kids and our spouses actually become careers um, or they spur on ideas like this. Um, so um, how about uh, your, you have an older daughter or younger, uh, a, a, a younger sister? I have an older sister actually. Yeah. She's graduating from Drexel University. This ah, year. and then did, did she get lured into any of this? Yeah, she loves the cars as well. We, we both drive a lot of them and help work on them too. Well, that's terrific. So uh, the family that uh, collects together, goes together, and works together. Um, well, it's been great interviewing you. Thanks so much for taking the time with us. Thanks for having me. Well, terrific. I'm Dirk Burrows. This is Classic Drive Television. Uh, we hope to see more of these cars in the future. Stay tuned. My name is John Brady, and my car is a 1954 Jaguar. XK120 drop head coupe. I became passionate about Jaguars, uh, and I've learned how to say that correctly because I lived in England for three years. I like to leave my car uncovered in my garage because it's such a beautiful car, and it is a thrill to walk out and take a look at it and uh, get in it, open the garage door, and take a ride it's it's just absolutely uh, you know it's 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 a thrill it's still a thrill every time i take it i love driving it and i am passionate about it as you can tell and uh it's just uh it it can keep up with modern traffic it can it it goes along very nicely at 75 uh and that's about the today's speed uh, you know in, in traffic Hi, I'm Dirk Burrows, and I'm on the set of Classic Drive Television. And to that end, we'd like to have you here, too. Classic Drive is having a contest, and we're going to invite three enthusiasts with their cars to spend the day with us, learn all about them, and who knows, maybe even become a car star themselves. So get your pictures together, tell us about your car, and send it to us to the address below. And make sure you check out our website and Facebook page for other details about this contest and upcoming episodes at Classic Drive Television. Hope to see you here. Hey, we're in the shop today, and we're going to talk about things that are cool or actually not so cool. Uh, this past June, uh, took the uh, Rover P3 out for a ride, and it overheated. In fact, it wouldn't even hold water. So when I looked further into it, and unfortunately I ended up having to take a ride with AAA back to the shop, I found out that I had a, a, a blown uh, water pump. Really couldn't understand, and I only had 500, maybe 1,000 miles on the car since I rebuilt it. When I dug in, took it apart, I found this incredible corrosion all through the pump and the uh, pipe into the radiator. So after looking at this, I found, hey, this might be related to my tried and trusted uh, green stuff that I usually use in, in the coolant system. So looking further into it, we talked to the boys at uh, Evans uh, Waterless Coolant and asked them to come on down and tell us about the solution that, uh, that could keep this from happening again and maybe keep uh, your car on the road as well. Mike? Great to have you. Dirk, thanks for having me. Terrific. So uh, tell us, what's this deal about uh, what is cool and why is it any different than my favorite yellow stuff here? Well, <laughs> the big difference is it doesn't contain water, unlike most other coolants that contain half water, right? Really? And you think about the problems that are caused by water, corrosion, electrolysis, the fact that water has such a low boiling point, it's likely to vaporize, build pressure, and overheat or overboil, right? actually. Yeah. yeah. So you can have a loss of coolant that's under severe pressure. It's a lot of stress on hoses, seals, and gaskets. That's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So how does it work differently, you know, uh, with our everyday driver versus uh, our classics, which maybe sit longer periods of time and don't get used quite as often? 
Well, you, again, water over time causes corrosion. Mm -hmm. And you have that buildup that just slowly happens, and your car can quietly corrode away if it's not being used, if it's not being circulated through the system. That's why a lot of museums have begun to use Evans Waterless Coolant. It just stops electrolysis, it stops corrosion, and the coolant will last indefinitely as long as it's not contaminated. And that means you have long life, almost permanent protection with the waterless coolant. Ah, so, so the idea that I need to change this every year or two versus a waterless coolant, which in theory is going to last, if it doesn't get contaminated, maybe, maybe five, maybe ten years. Or longer. A lot of really? museums have used it and car collectors have used it. And uh, many I know, including uh, the Simeon Museum, um, Jay Leno, uh, the American Muscle Car Museum. And uh, Jay Leno's case, he's had it in his cars for 18 years. We test the samples, and it looks like the day we put it in. Is that right? Yeah. So really, this is a pretty inexpensive way of ensuring your car doesn't corrode and you've got coolant that's going to last. That's right. It, it is inexpensive in the long run. Certainly without the water, it may cost a little bit more than your 50-50 standard coolant. But it will save you money in terms of preventing the corrosion, electrolysis, a corroded radiator, water pump. Um, prevention of overboil like we mentioned and you never have to change it out and if you never have to change it out you think of the time the cost it just all that goes away well really and the wear and tear on the car itself right exactly right. exactly yeah. as you've experienced I mean, absolutely yeah. <laughs> so uh, a little earlier we actually went through a process called prep fluid on the on the rover and we're actually ready to install the the waterless coolant in the car so we're going to invite Chris in to give us a little technical help and show us how we go about doing it. So I'm here with Chris from Evans, and there's a few things that we need to do before we switch over to waterless coolant. It's not hard, but we need to pay attention to how the whole process works. Chris, tell us about it. So it is a pretty easy process in order to do it. It's obviously easy if you're working with a dry system after an engine rebuild or something like that. Um, but if in a system where you have, it's a not a a dry system, a wet system, and you have to flush the system out of all the water and residual coolants. What we use here is our prep fluid. What this is going to do, it's going to absorb all the residual water and coolant in the systems and flush it out of an area that you just can't simply do by draining it or trying to blow it out with compressed air. So you want to drain the system completely as much as you can. We're going to fill it with the prep fluid and you want to run it. You want it to get hot, circulate, you know, let it go through a heat cycle and everything, let it go through heater cores, all that, let it absorb all that residual water coolant, drain the system from there, and then you're gonna be ready for your coolant. Put it in, run the car up to temperature, drain it, and we're ready to go. Yeah, that's so great. Cool. Great. So once we've got the prep fluid through uh, the system, then it's just as simple as adding water to your radiator, except you're adding waterless coolant. Is that exactly. Just yeah. the waterless coolant at that point. All right. All right. Yeah. So we did pro we did uh, use the uh, prep fluid before before the show, and we've made sure that the uh, uh, the coolant system is is dry. So we're going to put in the uh, the waterless coolant now and, and show you how the process works. So it looks like we were all set to put the coolant in. What's uh, next, Chris? Well, now that we have the system prepped with our prep fluid and drained, fully drained out, we're just ready to simply just fill it with our coolant, bleed the system, and get you on the road. There we go. So, let's get going. So not that familiar green color that you typically see in the 50-50, no, is it? No, it's a yellowish tint to it, so you can decipher that you have the Evans coolant in there as well, rather than the green coolant. And one of the important things that comes along with the Evans fluid is a little sticker that says, hey, don't put water in. Make sure you put it on there so nobody accidentally adds water to it. Exactly. If you are in a pinch, you could add a little bit of water to it. You know, if you're on a jam on the road and you don't have Evans available to you, you could certainly add a little bit of water, but you just want to make sure when you get back home, drain a little bit of the coolant down, and then add more Evans straight, obviously without the water, so. There you go. So we're going to finish filling this up, we're going to warm her up, and then we're going to come back and see how we test this to make sure that we have just the right amount of Evans and no water in the system. So we're back at the bench, and Chris is going to show us how to check our coolant for water content using the refractometer. Chris, tell us how it's done. Well, here's our final step right here. This is our refractometer here, and then our sample of coolant that we just took out of the car. And what you're going to do is take your sample of coolant, 
Simply put a couple drops on the lens here. You want to cover a pretty large surface. So when you cover or drop the lens and cover the surface there, you see how it, it, it pulls out, yeah, right? Exactly. It pulls so. out around so you get a good view of it. Yep, yeah. No air bubbles, no nothing like that. So once we do that, then we're ready to look through, make sure we're uh, no water in the system. How's she look? Pretty good to me. Hey, look at this. Just like when I was a kid with a kaleidoscope. So it says, hey, no water in here. <laughs> That's terrific. Absolutely. And so that's easy and simple and available on the website, right? It is very simple, very easy. We, it does come with instructions too for anybody that does have some questions about it. Very simple to use, very easy process overall. So. Yeah, this took really, when you get right down to it, it could be done on a Saturday morning and, and you'd be ready to go. Exactly. I want to thank the guys from uh, Evans for coming on out and showing us how this is done. This is going to make a real difference to this problem in the future. And I'm throwing this out, but remember, You'll find instructions with, the, with everything you get from Evans. And don't forget to put the sticker on that says, do not add water. No water. No water. Thanks for joining us. I'm here with Herb Chambers, really personifies cars and cars ownership. Uh, really one of the king of classic cars as well. Um, Herb, thanks for joining us, really appreciate it. Well, thanks a lot, I appreciate you guys coming. Uh, this is a show that we really look forward to because there's such a vast variety of automobiles here. And there's hot rods and then there's classic cars and uh, I have a tremendous passion for automobiles. Obviously I'm in the business but there are people in the business that aren't crazy about it. I am. And um, I personally collect cars. Um, the Ferrari over here, the La Ferrari is mine. And, um, I just think it's a great exposure for people to see uh, the automobile industry for what it truly is, and it's an amazing business. So. Well, absolutely, and I think you know the fact that you're behind something that's here in the in the gar uh, public uh, garden, and that uh, more people really can see this and, and see the cars that you're, you're that are new as well as the the older cars is uh, is significant. It, it's it's different than what the majority of the industry does. It is. We also do I think five or six cars and coffee events at various dealerships around the Boston area. And we do it, I think, starting in May, and there's six or seven shows. And they're not something where you go to, to win a trophy or something like that. It's just you want to be with people that enjoy the same things that you do. And uh, I love going over there because it's fun to talk to people and ask them how long they've had the car, where do they get it from, what do they have to do to it. And uh, it's it's a, it's a thrilling uh, environment for me. So. Absolutely. If, if, uh, if you had to pick just one car, what would it be? If you could only have one car, what car would it be out of your collection? Uh, a 1972 Ferrari Daytona Spider, ah. which is a convertible. That's you right. You know that. Yep, yeah. yep. So is that, is that the first Ferrari, or is that there's something special about that one? No, it's one that I wrecked a long time ago, and Wayne Carini from Chasing Classic Cars found it in California. And he and I went out, and I purchased the car, and he restored it for me. Uh -huh. So I love that automobile. I remember that episode. That was a great episode. You saw it, and boom, you were on it. That yeah. was it. Immediately you wanted it. Well, well I was afraid somebody else might buy it. So <laughs> There you go. Anyhow, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you. Well, thanks so much for, uh, okay. for supporting the event and, and talking to us at Classic Drive Television. Thanks so okay. much. If you own a classic or about to get one and thinking about going on road trips, there's nothing worse than being broken down on the side of the road and no way to get home. So I like to have a few things with me to make sure that doesn't happen. Jumper pack, jumper cables, extra coolant, tie wraps, duct tape, flashlight, and of course the tools, screwdrivers, wrenches, and whatnot. And last but not least, a paid up AAA card. In 1904, Rover introduced its first car, a single-cylinder-engined 
automobile. From that point forward, it gained a reputation for liability, yet conservatism. But in 1962, it shocked the world with its rakish coupe design, but it lacked one thing, power. But in 1967, it got its due from a discarded GM engine, a 215 cubic inch power plant, and it got the oomph that it needed. So let's take a look at this power plant. From 1965 till 67, Rover worked tirelessly to get this engine ready for production. It had to transfer originally gravity-fed cast-in uh, cylinder liners over to a sand cast block where they pressed the cylinder liners in after. They had to deal with the Rochester carburetor that was finicky on cornering and would cut out and transfer over to SU carburetors. But they finally did it in 67 and had their engine ready for production. At that time, this engine produced a little over 140 horsepower and really gave the car the power that it needed. In fact, this engine lasted in various forms until the late 90s and powered over 30 different car models through six different car manufacturers. So quite a, quite a difference between GM three-year production and Rover's 30-year production. What do you say we take this car for a drive? All right, so we're driving the 1970 Rover P5B. So this is the coupe version of the Rover lineup of the P5s in sort of the rakish and uh, V8 version. So this is the most coveted of them. Uh, so we're out for a drive. Uh, it's a beautiful summer day. Uh, the V8's very happy in the 80 to 90 degree weather. Uh, it's an automatic three speed. Uh, so not a lot of shifting here, uh, gentle, uh, pillowy ride. This wasn't a sports car, but you know, when it needed to get up and go, it did. Uh, you know, this was uh, when the UK was, you know, getting into the V8 craze. Really their first V8s, or a few, came in, uh, came in the 60s, where, you know, in the US we had V8s forever, so. We were well into the hot rod age then, uh, but uh, this is the UK's version using the GM215 engine, which they uh, they ended up purchasing from them uh, in around 66, 65. So we're out for the drive. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see how this car goes. Uh, it's very well appointed, so this will be a cushiony, uh, pleasant drive. Uh, the only thing she lacks is AC, but uh, later models did include those. So the Rover P5 was uh, the Queen's favorite car. In fact, she had two Rovers. She had a Rover P5, which 1970. <coughs> Thanks. So this was the Queen's car. The P5 was her favorite. She had first a, a Mark III P5, which was the six-cylinder version. And then in 1968, she had the P5B saloon. It was said that she would take drives uh, anonymously out and about on quite regular basis. And uh, so she really enjoyed the car. And well, if it's good enough for her, it's certainly good enough for me. This car was also the choice of uh, a number of prime ministers through Margaret Thatcher. Uh, when a car we've tested in the past came about, the Rover SD1, uh, the rakish look of that car just was not going to be correct for the Prime Minister. So they actually bought a hundred of these cars in the last year of manufacturing and tucked them away. Uh, and they lasted through to the early 90s. So you can see old films of the Prime Minister there on Downing Street being picked up in a Rover P5B saloon. Uh, of course, Specially equipped. So the P5B was never imported to the United States, so this was originally a Hong Kong car and eventually made its way to Vancouver and then to the United States where I became its latest caretaker. Uh, she was restored by myself and uh, with the help of others and uh, uh, turned out pretty nice. I'm very happy with this car. And, uh, for both cruising, both long distance, as well as short rides around the town. It's a, it's a, it's a deceive, deceives the eye. It looks a lot bigger than it actually is. 
but it's very well appointed for, for four people and of course you could squeeze somebody in the back and make this a five person automobile.